Well, we are actually in the middle of a study in the book of Romans, but as we're getting into chapter 8, one of the things we've noticed is that the Holy Spirit comes bursting forth in chapter 8 like we haven't seen him prior in the book. So we're taking just a brief, uh, probably three weeks here, to study the doctrine of the Holy Spirit uh, so that as we continue on through Romans chapter 8, we will have a better understanding of this sometimes neglected member of the Trinity. And so uh, I'm not, for the sake of time this morning, I'm not going to read our text in Romans. We'll be coming back to that more specifically. But what I would like to do is uh, continue on in this doctrine of the Holy Spirit. I'm also going to try to be reasonable this morning in, in length. Uh, I realize that that hour is, is a big one. And so uh, we'll try to be reasonable with that as well. So let's go ahead and begin with prayer, and then we'll continue looking at this doctrine of the Holy Spirit and what a difference that indwelling spirit makes. Father, we thank you for the family of God. We thank you that we can call you Father, and brothers and sisters can call each other brothers and sisters in Christ, that you've adopted us into your family. We're thankful, Lord, that we can sing about that and praise you for it and rejoice in those realities. And we know, Lord, that a lot of that ministry, a lot of that reality is the work of the Holy Spirit in convincing us about the truth of Jesus Christ and ministering in our hearts and lives to where we are able to call you, Father, and you call us sons and daughters. So we pray that you would especially help us to understand and be able to rejoice in and live in the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, especially as we proceed through Romans chapter 8, Lord, that you would be glorified and we would be edified as we continue this study. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'm going to double check here. There we go. Water and a clicker. All right. So we're talking about the difference that the indwelling spirit makes. And in order to understand a little bit more of, of who it is we're talking about, we're focusing in a little bit more on the Holy Spirit. Naturally and rightfully, we preach a lot about Jesus Christ. We preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. But the Holy Spirit is also a member of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is God. And and sometimes perhaps he's neglected, maybe more in our circles, I don't know. You know, some people abuse the doctrine of the Holy Spirit by making the Christian faith all about getting healed or speaking in tongues or throwing around the Holy Spirit like some kind of a powerful force to be used at our disposal. And Jesus Christ crucified is sometimes ignored and replaced by the promise of health and wealth. So you have that side of, of abuse of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, but there are others, and perhaps this might be more the error of some in the Reformed camp, where we could be described by J.I. Packer in chapter 6 of Knowing God, where he says, They are for practical purposes in the same position as the disciples whom Paul met at Ephesus. We have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Acts 19 and verse 2. So what do we desire? We desire a biblical balance, understanding what the Bible teaches us about who the Holy Spirit is and the ministry that he carries out from the Father and the Son in our lives, recognizing that one of his main roles is to point us to the Lord Jesus Christ, to help us to understand him and believe him and believe on him, but I think it'll be helpful and beneficial for us, especially proceeding through Romans 8, to have a little bit of a more current, you know, fresh remembrance of who the Holy Spirit is. And as I said a couple of weeks ago, this is not just an apologetics question. Some of the material, as I'm going to bring it up on the screen, you know, it, it's theological, it's some, a little bit academic, not hopefully in a dry way, but, you know, there, there's information there. But it's not just an apologetics question of defending the faith. Uh, yeah, that there indeed is a trinity and a Holy Spirit, and he's a person and not a force and that kind of thing. 
But this is also a question of our everyday Christianity and faith lived out as we, like Paul says, learn to live in the Spirit and walk according to the Spirit. Last time we looked at the New City Catechism question and the Heidelberg Catechism question on the Trinity. Uh, I'll leave those in the files here. But what I wanted to point you to today, and maybe this would be a good Lord's Day activity, but there are some historic Christian creeds that you could call Trinitarian creeds, creeds that address the doctrine of the Trinity. And um, I, would, I would encourage you, maybe even as a family, to look these up online and to maybe read through them and see how the, the church wrestled through some of these doctrines and what they came up with as they fought off heresy in, in these ways. So the Apostles' Creed uh, is certainly one with some people thinking the first version and possibly being actually around 140 AD, which would not then be the Apostles themselves, but people summarizing the teaching of the Apostles. But you can find that online. Uh, the Nicene Creed would be one I would point you to, as well as the Athanasian Creed, which was especially about the Trinity. And uh, one place you can find those, and, and you can search and find them in numerous places, but carm.org is one where you can find those if you are interested. And I'm not going to take the time to go through those here from the pulpit, but it would be interesting perhaps for you to look and see how the early church fought through the issues of the Trinity and the doctrine of the Holy Spirit and the deity of Jesus Christ and some of those kinds of things. And I would just point you to those and encourage you to, uh, to look those up as you have opportunity. So what we've been saying about the Holy Spirit, starting with our first session, is, is really kind of simple. We're looking at two things. And that is that the Word of God presents the Holy Spirit as what we would call the third person of the Godhead. The third person of the Godhead. And so as we're proceeding, what we're talking about then, first of all, is how the Word of God presents the Holy Spirit as a person, not a force, not the same thing as the Father or the Son, and then we're going to be looking at the other issue of the Word of God presenting the Holy Spirit as deity, as God. Now, last time we were together, we started looking at this first part, that the Word of God presents the Holy Spirit as a person. And we looked at these four elements of personality that people often recognize that kind of would be a distinction between a force or a substance, and a person. And so we saw these four major characteristics of personality, and I encouraged us that as we proceeded in the study, we would be seeing these in the person of the Holy Spirit. And we've already covered them, but I'll just point you to them again today. Intelligence, the ability to reason. Will, the ability to make deliberate decisions. Feelings, and God does not have the same feelings as men, but he is portrayed in a sense as having a certain kind of div divine emotion. And then individual subsistence or independence. And in this case, having one God who exists in three persons, and those persons actually having a certain measure of individual subsistence from one another, you know, being three distinct persons and not just three different modes of the same thing, not just three different appearances of the exact same thing, but three different persons that together make up the Godhead. So we were looking at these four different characteristics of personality, and then we began to look through these things. So first we saw that the Word of God refers to the Holy Spirit as a person, and very simply just said, you know, the Holy Spirit is seen as a person functioning as a person would. Uh, secondly, the Word of God attributes personal acts to the Holy Spirit. We spent some time here because really this is a lot of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, isn't it? And we could, we could have said more than we did, but the Holy Spirit does personal things. He teaches us about Christ, bears witness to Christ, forbids certain activities. He sanctifies or purifies, makes holy, and we'll actually be seeing that more in Romans chapter 8, more specifically here soon. Later on in Romans 8, interceding on behalf of others, searching out the deep things of God for the, for the benefit of believers, and choosing spiritual gifts. These are actions not of a force, but of a person. 
And then where we ended up last time is that the Word of God describes the Holy Spirit as personally distinct from the Father and the Son. It's not just another appearance of the same exact thing, not just a mode, a different mode, but rather uh, a distinct person. And we saw that, you know, the Father sent the Son and the Spirit. The, the Son is also seen as sending the Spirit, and they're seen as distinct from each other. And that's where we ended up um, the last time we were together. So I think what we're going to do this morning, um, not wanting to go too long, I think what we're going to do is take two more weeks. Uh, we're going to take today to finish out this personhood of the Holy Spirit, and then next time we'll look at and hopefully finish up with the deity of the Holy Spirit and also desire to make some applications here along the way. So we're continuing on then now with new material, and so those are the first three points of how the Word of God presents the Holy Spirit as a person. And so now here's number four. And you see a case building. And by the way, while, while my outline says we're talking about the Holy Spirit being a person and being divine, I want you to also notice as we continue on here that we're seeing a lot about who the Holy Spirit is and what He does and how He ministers and the value that He has to us in our relationship with God and in our daily walk of faith. The Word of God portrays the Holy Spirit as one of three persons equal in power and authority, or you could say equal in divinity or godness. And the Word of God portrays that. One of the places is in Matthew 28, 19, the very familiar words of the Great Commission. Now, I'm going to read most of these passages for the sake of time, but you're certainly free to try to, to stay with me if you can, if you want to look them up. But I'm um, reading straight from the scriptures. Matthew 28, 19 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Here is one place where the Holy Spirit portrays, or the Word of God portrays the Holy Spirit as one of three persons equal in power and authority. When we baptize... We baptize in one name because there's one God. So we baptize in the name, singular, of the Trinity, plural. We baptize in the one name of the one God, but the three persons of the one God. And the Holy Spirit is shown to be a person of the Godhead here, just like Jesus Christ and just like the Father. We baptize in a, we could say, a, a the Great Commission has a Trinitarian baptism. Kids, you know what Trinitarian means? It just means it's related to the Trinity. And do you know what the Trinity is? Do you remember from the catechism questions from a couple weeks ago? The Trinity is the concept of the three persons in one God. And so when we talk about God being Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons in one Godhead, that's the Trinity. Trinitarian is just an adjective that means we're talking about that. So when we're talking about a Trinitarian baptism, we're talking about a baptism that is in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We also have in 1 Peter 1-2 what we might call Peter's Trinitarian greeting. As he opens up his book in first, of 1 Peter, he says, he's talking about the recipients of the letter. He says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. It's another one of those places where each member of the Trinity is named. Oftentimes when this happens, we see a little a glimpse as to maybe uh, a peculiar role of each member of the Trinity, but they're named together as the three persons of the Godhead. Well, in Peter's Trinitarian greeting, he mentions uh, the foreknowledge of God the Father, the sanctification of the Spirit, and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. One of the things you notice as you study the Trinity is that our salvation is Trinitarian. Each member of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, has a particular role. Related, united, but also distinct. The roles that they play in our salvation. Well, what we're talking about here in particular are some of these passages 
where the Holy Spirit is seen along with Jesus and the Father as a member, a person of the Godhead or of the Trinity. I'm going to show you one more and then I'm just going to mention a couple more. Here we have what you could call a Trinitarian benediction. And, um, you know, I had this down for last week and then I got sick. And so I, I just asked if we could do it again today. So I think we're probably going to have the same benediction we had last week. But that's all good. And that's this verse right here, 2 Corinthians 13, 14. I'll read it at the end today for our benediction. It's a Trinitarian benediction. It says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now, sometimes the word God is used to refer uniquely to the Father, as is the case here. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So you have Trinitarian baptism, a Trinitarian greeting, and a Trinitarian benediction here, all illustrative of this principle. Well, this was Paul's blessing to the Corinthians. And this uh, word communion here, the communion of the Holy Spirit, as some of you might guess, is that Greek word koinonia, that sharing of having something, holding something in common with others. So the idea is that the Holy Spirit gives us gifts that we have not earned, grace. He helps us to know the assurance of adoption by the Father. He helps us to experience the truth about the person and work of the Savior, and the Holy Spirit helps us to share these blessings with others who have also been the recipients of God's grace. That's why Paul refers to the communion of the Holy Spirit. So by the Holy Spirit, we have fellowship with God. And by the Holy Spirit, we have fellowship with those who have fellowship with God. The Spirit gives us the understanding and the assurance to be able to say, Abba, Father, to cry out to God as, as Daddy, as the, the Father who loves us personally like a child. So that means that the Spirit also gives us the understanding and the assurance to be able to say, Brother, Sister. Now, for the sake of time, I'm just going to show you two more just for reference. I'm not going to turn there or read them, but... You see the same principle in Ephesians 4 and in the book of Jude, where the Holy Spirit is listed with the Father and the Son as another person of the Trinity. Number five, we're talking about the Word of God presenting the Holy Spirit as a person. Well, number five is the Word of God warns us that the Holy Spirit can be sinned against. And that's another case for his personhood. You don't, we joked last time about, you know, ticking off electricity, you know. It's funny because in order to have that concept, you have to personify the electricity. Because electricity is an impersonal force. It doesn't get ticked off unless you give it the qualities of a person. Well, the Holy Spirit is a person, and the Holy Spirit can be sinned against. He can be grieved. And that is another part of the case being built for the personhood of the Holy Spirit. One example is the unpardonable sin. Matthew 12, 31, Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Now, there's obviously a lot behind this teaching of the unpardonable sin. You know, in the context of Matthew 12, the Pharisees were actually accusing Jesus of demon possession while he was doing the will of the Father by the power of the Spirit. And so while there's been a certain amount of debate about what this actually is, it seems to be that, you know, because Jesus says, you can even attack me. But there can come a time when somebody so accuses the Holy Spirit and attributes to him the work and the power of Satan 
that it is uh, an ultimate rejection of Christ himself by blaspheming against the Holy Spirit, who is the one primarily tasked with convincing us about who Jesus is and what he's done. I will say this, we don't have time to really get into this this morning, and I will just say that if you're seriously concerned about your sin before God, and you come to him in faith, believing on Christ as your only hope of salvation, then you are manifesting the fact you have not committed the unpardonable sin. And I would just say, keep seeking the Lord while he may be found. But that is not descriptive of someone who has committed that sin. But what I want us to see here this morning is that Jesus teaches that if we were to commit this unpardonable sin, it is a specific violation against the person of the Holy Spirit. And we're warned that the Holy Spirit can be sinned against. Another case is the story of Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 5, where you remember they, they wanted everyone to think highly of them. So they sold some property and they pretended that they were giving it all when they were just giving a portion. And they were lying so that people would think more highly of them. And in Acts 5 and verse 3, it says, But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Now, this is a significant text on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit in a couple ways. One is, it shows us that it's possible to lie to the Holy Spirit. Peter says, you filled your heart, Satan has filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. But what also is significant in this passage is a direct statement from Peter saying that the Holy Spirit is God. We'll get to that point more specifically, Lord willing, next week. But you notice that at first Peter says, Satan has filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. And then he says, you have not lied to men, but to God. So the idea here is that two things. One is that the Holy Spirit can be lied to, again, proving his personhood. But then Peter comes right out here and says, if you've lied to the Holy Spirit, you've lied to God. And that kind of foreshadows the point next week that the Holy Spirit is also God. And then there's a third illustration here from Ephesians 4 and verse 30 that the Holy Spirit can be grieved. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now I realize that there's a lot of talk about whether or not God can actually feel sorrow or emotions and there's a big debate about that. So I'm just going to be a really simple guy here for a moment and say this that the word grieve means to make sorrowful. And while God does not have passions like men, uh, we're taught here in this passage that in some way it is possible for us to make the Holy Spirit have a sense of sorrow or feel grief because of our sin. And we're told to not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom we were sealed for the day of redemption. So however you want to interpret that, How do we grieve the Holy Spirit? What would that look like? What would that mean? Well, when the Holy Spirit does all of the things that we have talked about concerning our salvation, convincing us about Jesus, who he is and what he's done, regenerating us, sanctifying us, helping us to understand and apply the word of God, all of the things that we've seen even to this point that are the role of the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit does all of those things and the provision has been made for us to live in holiness and our adoption has been secured and then we live like we're not children of the Heavenly Father, that grieves the Spirit. And so Paul says, let's not grieve the Holy Spirit. Let's work with him to live in assurance and sanctification and fellowship. Well, there's obviously a great deal more that could be said about those points. But I want us to see primarily here that the Holy Spirit can be sinned against. 
And then the last point under this heading, that the Word of God presents the Holy Spirit as a person, is that the Word of God distinguishes the Holy Spirit from the power of the Spirit. And this is especially important for those who would try to reduce the Holy Spirit to some sort of force, which is more common than you might realize, especially with cults and those who deny or reject the Trinity. They would say, Jesus was just a really good man and an example, and the Holy Spirit is some sort of a force or a wind. After all, pneuma can mean spirit, right? It can mean wind. And so he's just a force. Now, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a little, um, we're going to have a short daylight savings break. I'm going to ask everybody to just stand here for a moment. I really feel blessed as a pastor with uh, the attention that the Lord's people uh, give the preaching of the word. I really am encouraged by the way you hear the word. And so when we come to a day like today, it's in stark contrast. <laughs> when I see people dropping like flies, I'm like, the saints, Lord, were weak. If I were sitting down there, I'd be sleeping on me too. So <laughs> I've been there many times, so I understand. Stretch if you need to. I wouldn't even rule out jumping jacks. That's up to you. All right, let's be seated here, and uh, we'll just look briefly at this last point and then some application. All right, the Word of God distinguishes the Holy Spirit from the power of the Spirit. I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm just going to list these. I'm just going to mention one because they're actually all kind of similar. I'm going to mention the Romans 15 passage. Romans 15 and verse 13 says this, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, that's just simple, everyday, normal language of Scripture, you know, as far as you and I are concerned. But if you were somebody that wanted to say that the Holy Spirit was a force, then you know how that would actually read? It would read that you may abound in hope by the power of the power. Or by the power of the force. <laughs> Some of you might like that one a little bit better. Uh, <laughs> it's, you know, fits your culture, your, your genre. The power of the force. But that's not what's being said here. And if you notice each one of those illustrations, if you uh, want to take the time, you could look them up and you'll see that you have the Holy Spirit and you have power. You have the power of the Holy Spirit but you see them listed separately because they're two different things. You have power and you have the spirit who is a person. It's one part of the whole case, but I think it is part of the case, and that is that the word of God distinguishes the Holy Spirit as a person from the power of the force. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You know, from the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm a little short on sleep too. I'm sorry. I'll try to be good. What I want to do uh, in our remaining moments here this morning is I want us to, um, to look at some applications, and then next week we'll, Lord willing, finish this out by looking at the doctrine of the Holy Spirit being God, being deity. Um, but what I want us to do this morning is take a little bit of a pause from that before we continue on to that next week and, and apply some of this stuff a little bit more specifically. I mean, one question that I would ask is, does this sound like a person to you? When you think about the elements of personhood that we studied and reviewed this morning, and those six different points about the personhood of the Holy Spirit, does this sound like a person to you or, or just a force? Well, going back to those characteristics of personality, intelligence was one. Well, remember, the Holy Spirit is one, for example who searches the deep things of God. The Holy Spirit certainly has intelligence. He chooses specific gifts for specific people as he chooses, as he desires. You know, in the church, we all have gifts. We saw that briefly a couple weeks ago. And the Holy Spirit is one who is uniquely tasked with this role of giving gifts to people in the church. There's will, the decision-making element. As we just saw, we have the ability in some sanctified way to 
you know, in some way that is appropriate to speak of deity in this way, we have the ability to make the Holy Spirit grieved or sorrowful. And we see very clearly that the Holy Spirit is not the Father and is not the Son, but rather Christ sent the Spirit from the Father to testify of Christ and to continue on the work that Christ had been doing. But they're not the same. And one heresy that has come about through church history is that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are just different names or modes or appearances for the one, just, you know, the one person, the one exact thing. And it's just one God and one person, and it just has different names. Well, we believe in one God, but three persons who have a unique relationship and unique roles. And so I would say, does this sound like a person? Absolutely, I would say this sounds like a person. This is the person of the Holy Spirit. The Bible portrays the Holy Spirit as accomplishing works that are specifically attributed to him. And while that doesn't mean that the Father and the Son are not involved, uh, the Bible does portray many of these things as personal works of the Holy Spirit. So I would say it's pretty clear here that the biblical record is that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. And that is Orthodox Christian truth. That the Bible portrays the Holy Spirit as the third person of the Trinity. And I will leave that right there like that. Now, here's a question for you to take home. Would you consider yourself to have a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit? You know, we talk about, of course, having a personal relationship with Christ. We might even talk commonly about having a personal relationship with God. But remember, when we're talking about having a personal relationship with God, that means Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so I believe that we should have a personal or individual specific relationship really with each member of the Trinity. And it, can, it changes a little bit depending on the member of the Trinity and what their role is. We are taught, for instance, to pray to the Father our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And there is a unique way in which we are directed to pray to the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit. But that doesn't negate the fact that each member of the Trinity is God. Together they are God. The Holy Spirit is a person of the Trinity. And he has a very special and intimate relationship with believers. Jesus himself, when he was leaving, said that he was going to send the Comforter. Remember, who is that? What are we talking about here? The Comforter, the, the Intercessor, the Advocate. And Jesus Christ himself, along with the Father, is seen in the Word as sending the Comforter to us. Remember, to continue ministering to us just like Jesus was ministering when he walked live here on the earth. We can say, brothers and sisters, we can say by faith that the ministry of God to us today through the Holy Spirit is every bit as real as the ministry of Jesus Christ was to people that hugged him. And the personal acts of the Holy Spirit that we've studied are presented as being part of a personal relationship with us. In fact, have you noticed when we look back at that? In fact, you know what? I'm going to take a minute here. It's just going to take a minute to kind of da 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 When we looked at those actual personal acts of the Holy Spirit. In other words, what are the things the Holy Spirit does? This is from last time. But think about these. He teaches us about Christ. He testifies to us about Christ. When he forbade this, the activity, it was in the ministry of the life of the Apostle Paul. He sanctifies 
us. He intercedes on behalf of us. He searches out the deep things of God for the benefit of us. He chooses spiritual gifts for us. You see, the Holy Spirit in his personal acts is being presented in the word of God as uh, that's all a part of his personal relationship and ministry to us. The Holy Spirit was given to us. He is for us. And he especially helps to apply the person and work of Jesus Christ to our understanding and to our application so that we will not only believe the right things, but then act accordingly in faith and regeneration from the Holy Spirit. So I know we often talk about having a personal relationship with Christ, but I want to challenge you to think about the concept of having a personal relationship with the Spirit as well as with the Father. To be, what a joy to be able to bask in the Father's love and think about God, particularly through fatherhood, and we think about the parable of the lost son or the prodigal son. What a joy to think about Jesus Christ the Son who was sent to die in my place to endure the punishment and the condemnation that was mine to endure. And what a joy to think about the Holy Spirit who is specifically sent to teach me the truth about Jesus and convince me that those things are so and to help me walk in light of those realities. So just because some people have abused the doctrine of the Holy Spirit... Let's not do the pendulum thing now the other way to the point where we minimize him or don't really want to talk too much about him. The truth of the Holy Spirit is there in the Word of God regardless of how it is overemphasized, de-emphasized, ignored, or abused. And so what we want to do is look squarely at what the Word of God teaches us about the Holy Spirit and, and live in that and believe that and have that kind of a relationship. And I realize I haven't said everything there is to say about the Holy Spirit, and I won't next week either. But we've said enough, haven't we? To see that we are designed to have a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit. So not only is it important for me to defend, that's what Reformed people are good at, right? To be able to defend the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. That's good. But you know, you could defend the doctrine of the Holy Spirit and go to hell. It's not enough just to have right orthodoxy. We need to have a right relationship with the Holy Spirit, with our triune God. So sure, of course it's important to be able to defend the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And, and a lot of what I've had on the, on the screen and what we'll continue to look at next week, you could say are apologetics notes. It's the defense of the faith. But it's vitally important for us to understand him better and allow that knowledge to draw us to the triune God in worship and thanksgiving. I'm not saying we exalt the Holy Spirit above the Father and the Son, like I, I'm afraid some people maybe do. But we don't want to leave him in the shadows either as some sort of an ambiguous force we don't understand. You see, the Bible actually does say quite a bit about the Holy Spirit, and it can be helpful to pull it together and see it kind of in one place at one time. And that's part of why we've been doing what we have. Do you have a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit? And that's the question I want us to continue to be thinking about as uh, once we finish this, to you know, this brief topical study and we get back into Romans 8 and we're talking about what it means to walk in the Spirit or walk according to the Spirit, I want us to have all these things resonating in our mind as we take up that instruction. Now, for those of you who don't know Christ, your primary relationship with the Holy Spirit is he is the one who convinces you of the truth of Jesus Christ. He is the one who regenerates and brings new life to one who is dead in trespasses and sins. And so, you know, if, if God is gracious to bring you to faith, and I would, ch I would challenge you, as I did just a few short weeks ago, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ 
If God is gracious to you in that way and you do indeed believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, it's the Holy Spirit who is going to give you the eyes to see specifically. He's the one who specifically is going to regenerate you and cause you to live and give you new life and enable you to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And for some of you, maybe that's the prayer you need to pray. Holy Spirit, teach me the truth. Convince me of the truth of Jesus. I'm struggling to believe. Convince me of the truth of Jesus Christ and help me to embrace him as my own Savior from my sin. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for sending the Spirit, for sending your Son. Lord Jesus, we thank you for sending the Spirit and for being obedient to do the will of the Father and to die on our behalf. And Holy Spirit, we thank you for the work that you do in our lives, for causing us to know and to love Jesus and to have a desire to love him above all others. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for the salvation that is ours that you have accomplished on our behalf. And we pray that you would teach us what it means to walk daily in the Spirit, to live out that salvation that you have accomplished so graciously on our behalf. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that in a particular way, you would come with regenerating power to the lives, to the hard hearts and the cold, icy hearts of those who are still dead in trespasses and sins. Show them the glory of Jesus. Show them that Jesus is the only way. Show them the absolute necessity to believe on him. But then convince us all, Lord, and remind us that having believed on Jesus, that is everything. That is enough. That is all we need. We must have Jesus, but having Jesus, we have everything. Holy Spirit, be merciful to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.